Then it's five, four, three, two, one. Hey, everybody, it's time for Tell the Damn Story, the show that celebrates the trials and tribulations, the successes and failures of writing. And we talk about our experiences hoping to smooth out your journey as a writer. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, that's right. That's normally Chris's job. But Chris Ryan isn't here with me today. Chris, I miss you. Actually, Chris is doing double, double duty this time because that's what happens when, A, you're an actual full functioning writer and you're promoting your latest book, which uh, is Ghosted. All right. And Chris has got some horror stories out there. And that's really, he's so excited about that. And he's also uh, a publisher and bon vivant man about town. So his latest publishing endeavor is a wonderful a book called Crete This Way, which was written by the wonderful Rebecca Cuthbert. And that's out. Both these books, Ghosted and Creep This Way, are now available on Amazon. So go get them. So, Chris, go get them. Do your thing. I got this kind of. And what I got is a great interview today. And it's a little something different because here on Tell the Damn Story, we have interviewed and, and we've done over 300 and some odd episodes. But Chris and I have interviewed oh, writers of comics, novels, graphic novels, plays and films. But today we have a returning guest, someone who was with us a few years back. But this returning guest is coming to us with a whole nother project. And I'm looking forward to this opportunity. So first, Rob, and forgive me if I don't do this, I should have asked you before in the green room. Is it Stenzinger? Right on, Alex. Yeah. Done. Done. Rob Stenzinger, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Alex. Thanks so much. It is it is awesome to be here, to be back. Of course, I miss having Chris here too, but schedules, what can you do? It's wonderful. Thanks for inviting me back. And oh. right on. I So I'm an independent game designer and user experience designer. I'm a teaching artist as well. And yeah. And you excited. live where, sir? What part of the world? Minnesota. Yep. There you go. See, as we, we reach out across the globe for folks to come to this show and inform the aspiring and emerging writers and creatives that are out there. And Rob, as I said, Rob was on the show. I think we were figuring about what, three and a half years ago, something like that. Which is wild, but time flies. Yes. About yeah. That. Yeah. With a good buddy of ours, Jersey Drods. And I always mm. try to pronounce that one. Both of you have challenging last names. I got something simple like Simmons. <laughs> There's no real challenge there. <laughs> but you, know, you guys had a great show uh, at the time, and, and Chris and I were happy to join you guys and have you on our show. It was just wonderful. It was just great. Yeah, and that, that's, yeah, Jersey Droz and the Lean Into Art podcast, which we did for about 10 years, around 300 episodes. Yeah. And um, yeah, a lot of common ground there between with what, what we've been up to and what y'all do here. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And 300 is that 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 interesting number, because as Chris and I hit the three, we went, well, wh where do we go from here? And what are we going to be doing? And a lot of those thoughts and that process happens. Have you done all that you want to do? Do you go forward from here? What else is there? And we're still trying to figure that out. So I may lean on you <laughs> in the days to come and get some sort of advice on that. It's. I know it's tough. It's almost like a new beginning in a way you mm. so far in, into a project. And then like in the beginning, beginning you, you weren't doing the thing and you're just deciding like, where do I aim myself and, or, or where do we go with this endeavor together? And, and you launch and you figure it out along the way. And, uh, which I think is a pretty fantastic method, actually. It's not quite flying by the seat of your pants. I think it's purposeful and creative and stuff, yeah. but it inherent, inher inherently evolves. But then having the benefits and the situation of doing something for a good chunk of time, it's almost, it is a new beginning in a way because you have this big frame now behind you mm. and you're like, so now we did that and now what next do we, yeah. And I think of that, like when I was working on Word Turtle Island, for instance. Yes. Which we're going to get to folks. We are. Yep, yep, yep. Not to cut you off at all, because I thought you were still going there. But as I said, folks, it, Rob is coming at us with a new field or at least a field that we have not explored 
really. I almost wish that one of the co-founders of Tell the Damn Story, Tim Fielder, were here. Because Tim spent some time in the video game arena from the art and the artist side of it, drawing and creating material. And he also speaks the language of some of the processes involved. But I shall do my best. But first off, Rob, before we get there, because everybody starts somewhere. Before you were all that you are now, you were this wonderful younger person with some sort of a dream or a goal. Was it to be a writer? Was it to be an illustrator? Was it to be a lawyer? Well, who is Rob and, and how did he start on this path? Wow. So yeah, hey, we don't make it simple here. Yeah. I, I'll do my best to to step up to this question. At an early age, I I felt recognized by making drawings. And I felt great when I drew rockets and when I drew Snoopy and folks knew what I was drawing. And that's, that was right around before kindergarten. And, and so that stuck with me. I'm jumping ahead thinking, ah, yes, I'm on this artist path, right? What does that mean? How does that put food on the table? I'm not sure, but I'm going to, I've continued being on this artist path. And I thought for sure going to do this until I talked to my guidance counselor in high school who scared me, but I think I was ready to be scared. Like it's one of those things where it's like sometimes folks can hit you in a way that it like emotionally where you're like, this is almost what I think it's almost like what I want, wanted to hear. Right. Where he's mm. let's open the occupational outlook handbook, look for careers in art and all that. And I was like, okay, cool, cool. And then he's look at the, what's the, what is the yearly expected salary of a commercial artist? I was like, okay, it's that much, huh? He basically you know, walked me through a little bit of back of the napkin type math on how will you pay for a comfortable life doing that. And I was like, I had a big, oh no moment. I shouldn't have listened. I should have said, what is this? But I listened and then it was a puzzle for many years after that to like go, how am I going to make a living at this? And anyway, then, but I, the beginning of the, an, another really important beginning is when I realized how much I was interested in drawing, in some kind of storytelling, and in making digital things, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, wait a minute, this all comes together potentially in video games. I happened to be putting food on the table as a janitor at the time. I was working nights. I didn't mind the, not the circadian rhythm <laughs> that most folks enjoy. Yeah, I didn't honestly, need to do the nine to five, right? <laughs> No. Nope. And it's, so it gave me time where it's like my night job was like, my brain was free and I pondered and puzzled, like, how could I start something about making video games? And then I put together a group of friends and we started. And so that was the big start. We didn't succeed in making a thing, but we did get some skills that got us jobs doing tech stuff. Wow. Wow. So how old were you at that point? So I was 21. 22, 23, 24, somewhere that's, in that's there. A, that's a turning point time. Yeah, that, that, that's it. Yeah. So, so you guys work together, you, you, you form some sort of new studio feel to it and mm -hmm. just jumped in with both feet. Yeah, pretty much. It's like one of us, um, I mean, I was lucky to have the, the friends I had with the different experiences they had, even though we were a quirky, dysfunctional band. We had really different skills, backgrounds, inclinations, mm -hmm. right? Like the personality of that little adventuring group mix had enough energy and stuff to it where we stuck with the project and did grow as, as in starting to figure out how to make this thing. And so we were, we decided, okay, so we formed a company, Basement Brothers Enterprises. We started working on our first game, Samsara, right? Because it's one of the one of the people in the group was a philosophy major and, and was like, this is a fantastic concept of the never ending cycle of life and death. And let's work this into a story. And we just started building this way too ambitious thing, given our skills, but, but it was, we ended up with a super rough interactive demo, okay. which is one of the things you build. So you decide to make a game. You need to meet that concept somehow. Like when you're writing, you can do a rough draft or you can mm -hmm. outline do all kinds of things to meet your concept. You need something interactive that is a, that helps you face your own ideas. And, right. And so we 
we had a really rough version of that, plus some concept art, plus a lot of writing of chapters of the game and what have you. And so it's like a pitch deck for a film. I would say, yeah, it's sure. Absolutely. With the, with a little bit of a a sample scene in a way. Yeah. Okay. So you had all of that put together and what happened to the game? We had folks in our circles asking, because we're talking about what we're doing. We even had a website back in the day. So this was 1995-ish. And yeah. And so friends of friends were like, hey, can we, can you, can you all do an animation for our expo booth? Or could you make us a little form that lets us capture some data? Could you make a website for us? And all of a sudden we Uh, were doing uh. that. And getting paid, which is what pretty quickly led from, I don't mind doing this other work instead of being a janitor was fine. And I learned a ton, but like it was, this was way closer to what I wanted to do and whatnot. So I, yeah, I I made the career switch there. Um, Following the path or or was it riding the horse in the direction it's going for philosophy there? (laughs) Yeah. 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 That led to you being a a freelance, what would you call it, designer? Yeah, like web designer. Web designer. And how creative were you able to be as a writer or illustrator? Pardon me. It's, let's see, I didn't know what I didn't know. But it's one of those things that where I try to put together a framing or understanding of how can I do this better. I did that as a janitor. I do that as a, however I'm doing, whatever I'm doing, I try to understand how do I do this better mm. and to maybe do it again successfully or whatnot. And I noticed it was when folks come to you with a, please build me a website and it needs to tell the story of my business. It needs to, or maybe I'm start just starting out and I don't have any kind of branding and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. I was jumping into all kinds of different areas of study that I didn't fully realize how deep each of these different things were. But I think a lot of us who were in the, happened to be there at the early days of the web stuff, that was a common thing is it was like folks were, who showed up to be on the web were open to creativity and in, in some way, and they were being brave because lots of folks were also asking, what is this even for and why bother? And so they had some kind of creative bravery and vision to, to even try. And then it was a matter of like, how do I create with other people so they succeed? And, um, it pretty quickly was setting aside any kind of ego I had, like anything I needed to say, cause I was getting paid to do that thing. Mm. Um, and I, in the most part was realized I wanted to help people not fall on their face in a way, right. Mm -hmm. Out there and and do something. Well, cause some folks would come to you and say, I would like a, like so many things like technology is cyclical, right? Things like virtual reality and stuff was already a conversation then. And so people were trying to do VR ML websites, right. In Netscape navigator and stuff. And. And it was like, let's do something small, right? Yeah, you have this budget, but let's prove this idea. And so I didn't know I was stumbling into techniques I would like almost adopt instinctively and then get more thoughtful about it. Iterative design and creativity and prototyping and growing ideas thoughtfully. And then how do you include different people along the way? Mm. Um, but what's funny is I, so that I would say that set me up to help or to continue this, the tension I always had internally between I'm doing this to just pay the bills versus I'm doing this to express things I want to share with the world as a creator, right? That tension, I would say I, I learned more about navigating it, but it was still there. So the creativity aspect of your question, it was like. Yeah, I was trying to find a way to land that. Yeah, again, how we find our way to where we eventually wind up or where we want to be, which I see is sometimes two different things, is always a curiosity. 
And sometimes the path is fairly smooth and sometimes it's extremely rough and horrible. Uh, but when people make it, I was always curious, how did you get there? And how many other people are trying who can benefit from that knowledge? So I always ask. I'm always curious about that. And I always try and put that out there. So let's jump, uh, as, as you did so eloquently a little while ago, let's jump forward a little bit. You, you've built a career. And I was looking at the, the document you sent to me earlier. I don't want to read the document. But it, it seems here like you, you had a lot of experience in the the UX and the game construction and development realm. Can you speak just a little bit about that? The interactive game industry, is that part of where you've lived for the past umpteen years? Uh, yeah, let's see. Yes, but no. So it depends on how do you draw the boundary as far as a lot of companies, you like they they hire people who do all kinds of things, but some a company will hire people to write, but they'll say, we're not storytellers or people will hire people to make software, but they'll say, but we're not a tech company. Hmm. And I, a lot of companies deal with creating game experiences and interactive experiences that have gameful aspects to them, but they won't say they're a game company. So there's being someone in, in spaces where a lot of new things happening, where, where, it, where it's just like a recurring theme in, in a lot of my career adventures I've had. And I've been at the ready when it seems like, aha, something in my toolkit would be helpful here, which is let's think about this like a game experience. And a game experience could be, let's see, I'm going to probably not do the best job quoting, but I'll paraphrase like Jane McGonigal, who is a, someone who's written some great books in the space, like um, Reality is Broken. And it was like at the peak of the, um, when people were adding game dynamics to every website and whatnot. So like you get, you know, you earn tokens for doing a thing, you get badges, you get for, and, and that's adding in a way this positive psychology, positive reinforcement. You're getting rewards. Yes. You're rewarding the actions. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, but I think the, so she has this way of describing games is a, it's an, you, it's an optional challenge that people choose to engage with that has a feedback loop that. It is a, and which is a different kind of creation to do than other things, which are linear and whatnot, but it's, but it is pretty understandable and we can observe it, right? We can see you get together to play cards and mm -hmm. you know, you each know, understand the kind of boundaries of the space and you're choosing to go into that space to then interact with what happens. And there's, there's a feedback loop and there's, tem there tends to be some kind of the acknowledgement of in there, right? There's positive feedback there's negative feedback and i think anyway yeah so that can you can use that in a lot of ways to let's see like at a marketing company i was part of for a while there was a a system for so giving feedback for folks who are selling products mm -hmm. right and depending on how they did and when they did and in which product line there would be different like challenges, almost like discovering a dungeon in a, on a map and saying, do you want to go through that door? And the salesperson would decide it's, it's this is going to affect what I try to do. If I, in, in, in a way, engage with this optional challenge, if I pull it off, I get this reward, right? Right. I get this points. So I used game design a lot during that gig, but it wasn't working for like electronic arts or something. Right. So, on. so anyway, so I guess, cause they talk about dopamine fee hits. When we get something, when we get a reward, when we on either in a video game or in an interaction with somebody, we get a dopamine hit. It makes us feel good. So we want to continue to do that. And it's not that different, really, not that very different in terms of writing books or writing films or writing plays, because we are, as I tend to say to my students, we are writing these stories in such a way that it, it's, we're manipulating people's emotions. We are trying to guide our audience through a series of emotional reactions that's going to hit a climax point, and then there's going to be resolution, and we want them to be satisfied by the end of the experience. If it's a horror film or an adventure film or a thriller, we want them to go out pumped up, going, wow, that was really exciting, that was really great. If it was a, a tearjerker or something very sad and, and heavy, we want them going out really thoughtful and feeling the emotions of that. So again, what we're doing is using storytelling skills 
to place events in such a sequence that we hit these points and we stimulate these reactions in individuals. And now it sounds like we're having a psychology class here, but but that's that is the reality of creativity and storytelling and marketing and a number of other things. So let us get to, we're going to circle to other things again, but let's get to, you wrote just a couple of weeks ago, which brought up this, or, or should I say was a trigger for this event. Mm-hmm. You announced that you've created a game, a, a, a video game, as you call it, called Word Turtle Island. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, wait, what? He did? What? Why am I just hearing? Talk to, so can you help us understand one, what is Word Turtle Island? And two, why? And then let's play with that. So how, I guess, is it's what, why, and how? Easy. Three small questions. Yeah. There you go. We, we go. we got time. Oh uh, no, awesome. So Word Turtle Island is it's a video game and it's a what I'm calling it, it's a nature dungeon action shooter where you use words as weapons and you're battling these creatures who are stealing books from the most powerful library in the galaxy. Uh And that's, that's the crux of what is this? So you'd find a a lot of, if you've played games where you go venture off into dungeons and battle stuff, right? You you get, you'll find a familiarity there, but as far as the, let's see. So the, other aspect of this is that there is a story around there, right? There's like some creatures attack the most powerful library in the galaxy. Why? It has, each of them has their own agenda and they're this dysfunctional team of this negative force that they cause this big calamity on Word Turtle Island and it causes almost all the books and definitely all the turtles to disappear who were once the caretakers of this place. And this special type of book, who is a living being called a living book of power, there's a whole collection of them that they've gone missing. And that's a huge aspect of of what you need to do in the game is go rescue the books, the readers who happen to be caught up in this whole situation, and then the books of power. And that'll get you through the progression of the game. You play as Wart, who's this turtle, who is, a, who is about to leave this whole place, was, Wart was on his way out at, to just figure out his own path because he wasn't into the whole situation that was planned for him. But on his way out, he gets caught by Portia, who is the Book of Portals, who escaped the whole mess. Portia is one of the living books of power who is able to portal things and creatures all around. And Portia essentially recruits Wart into the effort to try to take back and fix the whole book sanctuary. A reluctant hero. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you got a hero's journey and a reluctant hero. Okay. Okay. I like this so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the, that's the framing of the what of the thing in as far as like how the game feels. It's not just jumping into dungeons of battles and stuff. That's part of it. And when you do, so like you use these word weapons, you'll like, Wart will throw a word axe and then it's actually full of of a line from Wart's journal. So as Wart fights, you learn more about Wart, right? Oh. And as the creatures are using words, they're using words in a way, this thing I just, I I started calling the word forge, this piece of the game I built that pulls out from 10,000 different words, themes of, oh, these want rhyme. And so you'll notice as the creatures are throwing words at you, they're rhyming. <laughs> okay. and, and there's different themes for what they're throwing at you. When you say different themes, can you give us an example? They're like groups of words. So they're, they're, let's say one of the themes would be, I'd have to open my code to pull out some accurate example, but I'll, I'll make it up. Let's say it's a list of colors, orange, purple, whatever would be, you'd see those words would come out. And and then the theme would be colors. Now, if you happen to capture, so one of the, one of the powers that a word turtle has is to capture words. Right. So if you capture words by one of the three ways of 
playing the game, which is a touchscreen or keyboard or game controller, either way, so, um, you're capturing words. If you collect enough words fast, you get bonuses. If you complete a theme, you get even more bonus, right? So like you'll get health and you'll get little, little, uh, basically the equivalent of gold in the game to be able to spend on upgrading your stuff. So what you're doing there is you're leveling up your character, you're leveling up your word weapons, you're getting word, you're getting powers where like it's powers make it easier. They're like automatic things that happen. So like you're in a nature dungeon and you're battling your way out and there's a, like a little reader to rescue and you might have a power that attracts them to you. So it's easier to, to rescue them, right? Stuff like that. And that's all happening in the midst of the, the battles. The quest. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to project my thoughts onto your work. I have to say though, that as you were ex uh, describing the game, metaphors were going through my head here. So I, when I asked why before I was thinking, why did you create this particular type of game? And then as you explain the story behind it or explain the pursuit within it, I'm thinking, wow, how timely this game is for so many reasons. So I guess I would have to ask you then, what motivated or inspired this particular storyline or this particular game? Let's, you can take that either way you wish. Hmm. So what motivated it? So the creation of the story, it's been this process of incremental work of making the interactive game and improving it and then thinking about the story about it. But I actually thought about the story before I started making the interactive game. I hope and so. Then, yeah. It gives you a place to start. Yeah. And, and it grew and changed like who Wart was and what, who is the main character, all that stuff evolved by creating the game and trying to weave something together that was a holistic combination of the interactive experience, but then the story that supported the experience. So what happened is I started with, I wanted to make an action typing game. And so I created these elements about that, but then I started to play around with other ways of interacting. And I thought it's not typing. That's most important. Typing's cool. I love that. And I have kept it. It's absolutely part of the game. Um, but like it's, um, there's this game that one of the, one of the games that inspired me was called, uh, typing of the dead. Right. So you've, you it's, which is a sort of morph of a different game called uh, house of the dead. Okay. Oh, you've got this, you're, you've got a, a camera going through a, a cartoony three-dimensional scene with creatures, zombies that come up and you're the, in that game, you're shooting the zombies in house of the dead and typing of the dead, the zombies show up with words on their chests and their, and you type that word and that eliminates the zombie instead of shooting them. Right. Okay. In a way I created both at once. Right. Anyway, but what I discovered is that the words are more important. I started asking, well, why are words important? And what, and my journey in figuring out how do I become confident enough as a writer to write and like the journey I faced when I was working on my comic years ago called Art Geek Zoo. And how I just, every post, every week, it was like this fraught challenge to mm. get words out and, and my art and slowly getting comfortable with that. But then, and now when I go back and I tell that story, I feel, I don't, I feel vulnerable, but I feel pride, right? Where it's like mm -hmm. figuring out a way to get through that. So how important are words? And I started like all these things that are adjacent, it, it, it morphed into, so where are words? This is going to have to do with books. And this has to do with, you know, collecting and protecting books. And what if what, there was this council of powerful books and what are they like and what's their situation? I suppose they would be incredibly, they'd be like a big asset to someone. And what if, and then who would want to work against this and what are some different ways? And so I came up with, it's essentially three different antagonists mm -hmm. one of them wants to utterly destroy the books but is this sort of celestial entity that needs to work through other beings that can take part in this stuff and so you've got two different turtles that have gone against their people right or 
whatnot. One of them is a, is like a, an overachieving selfish wants to do everything their way because they don't see how other people's points of view matter. A little right? dictatorial, and, I would think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And and then the other one is thinking about how did Word Turtle Island even come about? And I thought, it, you know what? It makes sense that this place existed for a long time. And it's this collection of all the sentient expression of facts and fiction throughout the galaxy. And these turtles have been, someone was collecting it. The turtles probably came into this after it was already in progress. And so those turtles may not be so friendly and library focused. <laughs> So this, the, so the other villain is a turtle from their warlike era and, oh. uh, yeah. And so that's, yeah. So then you have someone who really wants turtles to go back into their less, less friendly and sharing. And so you could use the, instead of, so yeah, one who wants to use the books for their sort of social manipulation agenda. You've got one who wants to use it for their military agenda. And you've got someone who's, I just want this to go away. And then when you think about what do those perspectives mean, you land right into the mix of a lot of conversation that's happening today. And, I th and then I realized, oh, look at me, what I've stumbled into. I've got an interesting space to, to dialogue with really important ideas going on today as far as like book burning, book banning, book manipulation of what gets allowed and observed and yeah. put in the whole space yeah. of published stuff. As I said, I, I couldn't help. As I'm listening, I could not help but see that, the parallels. And we often say, Chris and I often say, that a good deal of what writers pull from is their own POV on life. Things that we were taught, the things that we believe, the things that we feel, the things that we fear, the things that we love. The things we're curious about, all of these factor in and become filters for our creativity. And so naturally it raises, it, it, it rises to the top in some way, shape or form, or it's definitely a part of the subtext and the bedrock of things that we create. So this is really good. Was the, the other question was, I, you, and you explained some of that in terms of how your thinking built one, one stage onto the next. You know, like, how, first off, how in, in segments, how long did it take you to pull this concept together? How long have you been working on this? Let's see. It, it's been about two and a half years, all told. So from the very beginning, deciding amongst a collection of ideas, which thing do I want to build? And, and part of the plan was to make it also very much integrated with the story. Mm -hmm. Um, my, the goal for this was to not be a, a, like a casual game of casual games are awesome. And I've built ca casual games and I, in some ways curse myself for choosing not to build a casual game for two and a half years. <laughs> I would have be, been be careful done what you wish for. And even them, they can be like deceptively simple because it can take a lot to, to build something so simple. But I really wanted the, there to be story here. And so it wasn't accidental of that I found the story along the way. That was the point, is to find the story along the way. Mm -hmm. And then it just, and I would say many of the pieces were put together. I would say it was, it's been put together and taken apart probably over and over in six month loops as far as what, who are these characters really? All these other extra ideas, are they needed? Because it's easy to, I, I, for me, suffer under the weight of too many ideas about a story. And so I had to shed things along the way too. And in it's in, I would say probably it, roughly, I don't know, six to eight months ago, close to two years into the process is where I arrived at. Yeah, this is the story. And the goal was, is to tell enough, like how fighting games tell stories. Where if you ever played something like Street Fighter 2 oh, yeah. or, or Samurai Showdown or yeah. so you've got enough context to engage in conflict <laughs> and care about it, right? right and to yeah. feel a little extra pride or a little extra ouch if things go your way or don't go your way. So you if you win that fight, your character is gonna have a little aha, yeah. And this is my point of view. And then 
and then and whoever you defeated will might have a little bit of an ouch that's a bummer and this is my point of view and that was roughly the where i'm like i don't i need to tell enough story Mm -hmm. where this novelization it isn't a graphic novel but i need to find that enough story so i could tell that more detailed version if if when i get to that so here's a, a, another question that just came to mind and i'm thinking on, on a couple of planes I'm, I'm listening to you and i'm seeing aaron sorkins at the same time and yeah i h- hang on here it, it'll make sense in a second i hope Sorkins, being one of my favorite screenwriters, talked about what it was like to work on the TV series that he did. West Wing? Excuse me? West Wing? Yes, thank you. That, yeah, I knew it. Yeah. Had a senior moment there. But yes, he talked about West Wing and he talked about, which was so impressive, he talked about the duality of what he was dealing with because whatever his personal political viewpoints or social viewpoints might be, He was writing a story, a series about characters on both sides of the fence. And he could not just write for one side of the fence that he favored. If he wanted the real drama and the real stories and the messages and the conflicts and things to feel authentic and genuine, he had to be able to give equal weight to the sincerity that certain people felt, no matter what side of the fence they were on. And this was part of his challenge to be able to write as let's just call this the, the side to write as as a conservative or a liberal or, or or a Democrat or a Republican or whatever, to write those characters and what they said as if this is what they truly believe. And in a way, there's some slantings in terms of what you think the series is about, what you think are the heroic aspects of the series. But there's also some really good conversations in there where you can go, ooh, they made a good point. Or that's not as clear as I thought it was going to be. So I'm just wondering in terms of how you were working with this story, do you feel that your point of view on things led the charge? Or do you feel that you've written the story or developed the story in such a way that people can make up their own minds about things as they're going through it? Hmm. I am probably falling on my face in this regard where I think I'm just showing up and shouting into the world. I love books. Don't ban them. And I don't, I think it's admirable to pull it off. I, but do, and I I hope to find ways. I don't want to promise features, right? But it's one of the things I'm considering based on getting this game into the world, continuing development on it, because it's not done. It's done as in, it's done enough to play and have fun and to win the game. Like you can complete the game, get the whole story. But there's more. I want to add more points of view. And I do have practice in, in as like a user experience designer. I'm used to researching all kinds of different points of view and to try to weave something together that has like, in, is included enough uh, people who may not be present, who may not be getting paid to make this thing but that hopefully are being represented enough in the decisions that are being made that will affect them with this made thing. Hmm. So I'm used to doing some of these things as a professional practice, but then as a storyteller and as based on the budget and time of what I've done so far for this and the problems I've solved so far with this, I have not solved that problem that you're describing of, of I think there's maybe a hint of these antagonists have Maybe some interesting ideas in what they're doing, but I have not pulled off expressing those ideas yet. And I hope to, I would even love it. Like in the meta, like thinking about games that allow you to pick other characters to play through. Right. Mm. Even if there's not like you play through as every character in all situations, I've got some ideas on the drawing board of how you could play characters in like a battle or something like that. Mm Mm-hmm. It'd be neat to see what is the journal of, so that some of the antagonists, it's Docha is the sort of the arrogant overachiever. And you've got Reskel, who is the sort of the old school warlike turtle. And you've got Mir No Never, who is the, the, the sort of hard to, uh, the, the celestial being, right? And 
it'd be neat to be, find ways to play as each of them and hear their, what's in their journal. When they throw a weapon, what does it say? I would like to figure that out. And I would love to have some, I can't say Sorkin, but like it's something, something along the lines of this is at least feels fun to play with. It's like some games f actually fully offer paths of playing as a villain, right? And I don't think I would have the resources to pull that off with this, but, but I get it as a player, it's, it's fun to, you see a, a great episode of the West wing and you find maybe some surprising hooks in different perspective you don't normally consider it's that's one like you you made an awesome comparison earlier about comparing how in in stories we're trying to affect people through feeling and, and whatnot and in interaction we're trying to do yep. that with the through the experience as well just yeah. a little right. yeah anyway i would love to to i'd love to go there but i haven't gone there fully yet and again, I am often telling my students and my, my clients that creativity is, and I'm not fond of this word, but I, I find it useful. It's a process. It's an ongoing process. You are fine tuning, whittling away at molding, whatever phrase you want to use. You are working on this in stages as it develops until it becomes the piece of art that hopefully you were going for or that you feel, yes, this is where I can stop. There are steps and stages and, and there's time involved in that. And I hope I wasn't saying that you have to do such and such. I was just curious because again, the game itself, the concept that you've explained has that potential, that, you know, that feeling that could be in there. And I was just curious as to see, oh, it's to, to find out whether or not it was something that you had uh, even thought about or had added at this time. And that's fine. I think, again, another thing, you mentioned Street Fighters. Some of the, the games that I've played with my kids over the years who are now, they're all adults. Basically, you grow up playing these different games, everything from Mario Brothers to Street Fighters and beyond. One of the things that, that happens is there's these new generations of these games where they're, they've added something to it. They've added a different look or they've added more possibilities because the software has been developed or there's more story and you can see it from a different POV. I think that whatever you've accomplished with Word Turtle Island at this point is phenomenal. And I think the potential, just again, thinking about everything that you've shared, the potential is crazy. It's really very exciting in a lot of ways. I can also see in my head at least two different age ranges for this, because I think there could be a junior version of this for the younger audience that would allow them the same sort of excitement and, and curiosity and questing, but at a level that meets their readability level. And then of course, there's this other level that anybody and everybody of, of an older age can jump on. There's so many possibilities and I'm very excited about it. I guess the, the other question I was gonna ask you is, is two, but the final question I'll save until the last. So, the. The question I'll ask you now is what, how do you see this moving forward right now? You have it at the level you have it. You said a little while ago, it's available to be played now. So is it out there for us at this point? Hmm. Let's see. It's soon to be available to be played. It's playable now. So I've done a variety of sort of private play testing event, events and whatnot. So you've beta it to some degree, right? What's that? You've beta tested it to some degree? It, yeah. It, yes. And getting it into people's hands, getting it, making something interactive. That's so important to see someone else play it, having a beta reader and whatnot too. Like you mm -hmm. want to see, is this landing and having an effect? And there's all these like other gotchas that something interactive will have too, because it's this, the complexities of, um, how I click on the screen, I will keep clicking on the screen the way I click on the screen overall. And I can mess with it a little bit, but then someone else, it just, you can't un over s over to sell how much variety there is in other people. <laughs> Yeah, And having that meet your, what you make is really important. So I've done that in the small, but then it, what's happening soon is I'm about to publish it 
in early access. So in the coming weeks and early access means you get to be along for the ride for this chapter. If you choose to come along for the ride where this is where you could consider this like a public beta in a way it feels as an independent maker and how folks are the current vocabulary in the world right now, early access sounds like an appropriate term that folks mm -hmm. are using instead where it's, you get, if you choose to, you can buy your copy of this at a discounted early access kind of price and then see what happens or, or offer feedback and watch the change, watch it sort of those pieces come together over the next months or year or so that it's mm -hmm. going to take. And then it's, yeah. And so I plan on going to steam and Google play first, but then I've built it in such a way where I'm planning on going further than that. Okay. Wow. But it's one of those things where it's not really a Kickstarter or whatnot, but it, you can essentially vote with your dollars saying, yeah, please go further. Keep going. I want to see how this turns out. And, and yeah, but it's not fully complete yet. There's a whole list of things you can find out, like what's in there too. I'm sure I've mentioned lots of it, but if you go to wordturtleisland.com, you'll see a place where you can just sign up to, to get an email when I actually publish it. Yeah, I'll be doing that because I was checking the website earlier and I wanted to look at that. So yeah, I will definitely get on your emailing list because I, I happened to come across this because I found, I think it was on Instagram or TikTok that you did a video and I came across that. So, yeah. So, so then in there's independent publishing and there's mainstream publishing. Are you seeing yourself now that you developed this yourself and you put in two and a half years of your life on it? Are you thinking of independently publishing this to the world? Or are you hoping to be picked up by a larger entity? I think it depends on how that looks. I'm moving forward, however, with whatever happens, right? It's, I am publishing independently. And then it's, you can see all kinds of different options, like different businesses, different philosophies and how folks invest in, in different indie creators in the situations and partnerships they meet. It's all kinds of things like some, you, I'm open to that conversation for sure, but it's not my for sure, like stepping stone that I'm actually trying to make happen uh, because there's, I have a path forward. It's I'll be publishing to steam <laughs> and to uh, Google play, which is a pretty awesome thing as an independent creator to be able to like, you can publish a book to Amazon yeah. you can. Yeah. yeah. So I, I love the question. And I think that that kind of partnering and stuff or investment, it's worked out pretty good for folks like the person who made Stardew Valley. For instance, I could see that, but, uh, cause I am only one person, right? So, so I've noticed you know, having some help as far as the building and bundling and testing and deploying to PlayStation and Nintendo switch and Xbox. It's, it'd be nice to not have to do that, but it depends on how many dollars are associated to how, how many dollars get little wings and fly away. Yeah. Yeah. Based on that. I don't know. Yeah. But I'd have that conversation for sure. So two and a half years, and I'm, I'm coming to, to the final question, two and a half years. And it sounds like there's definitely some of your personal philosophy in this, because we talked about the absolute parallel metaphoric aspects of it. This is going to sound like a silly question, but I have to ask. If you put it out there only independently, and it, it does moderately well and all that, do you feel like you will have accomplished what you wanted to accomplish? Or do you feel you need a bigger, for lack of a better phrase, a bigger win on that? I guess I would liken it to say some people who write comics or graphic novels want to see it either picked up by a big company or turned into a film and then they'll feel like, whoa, yeah, I really made it. Where does all that sit for you in terms of personal satisfaction? I would say it's a mix of... I guess personally, I can be fueled by love. Professionally, I also need to be fueled by income. So combining them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would, I'm, my goal is to make this a, a reasonably 
successful independent effort. And I would love it to reach a, a wide audience that the, each of these different venues that, that where you can publish a game, many of them are open to an individual publishing independently. Hmm. Well, then it's just the question of marketing and awareness and getting enough eyeballs, people to, to know that it exists in order to even possibly make the choice, even though it, the choice is close, like right there at hand in the same, like at some point I do intend to get to the Nintendo switch. Right. And it's a matter of what will that be me as an individual or will I partner on that platform or whatnot? Yeah. I want to reach a lot of folks. I want this to be a financially successful endeavor and also personally gratifying to, to have found a story that I care a lot about. I thought tons about, do I want to make a, I, I love violent games. I love playing games where you're chucking swords around and all that stuff. But, but I've had to ask myself, what did I, how did I feel good about that conflict happening? And it had to be more about ideas and protecting the expression of ideas and stuff which is weird and meta and fun, but it's in my heart. And that's what I want to put in the world. I want it to land with folks and, and I want them to, to buy it. Yeah. So I wanted to reach a lot of folks and exactly the number. We'll see what happens. Excellent. Excellent. Rob, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. I, you know, it's, it's funny again, because when I saw the video for it, I went, wow, this is really I, I didn't know he, and I'm, I'm going through all these changes of, I didn't know you could do this. I didn't know about this. Wow. What is this? What is that? And then you sent me some material to read just before we, we started to meet to record this. And I went, this is really, this has got all kinds of little possibilities. And now that you've shared some of the deeper material behind it, I'm really rooting for you. You're a friend and I root for you from the heart on that one. But I do feel in terms of where we are today as a society in this particular part of the globe, information, inclusivity, knowledge about people and their different lives, their different experiences, which are chronicled in books, whether they're comic books, graphic novels, or novels. I think that the sharing of that information, the sharing of that history, of those experiences is so necessary to create something close to a more holistic world. And so I truly hope on so many levels that this becomes a part of the movement to keep that alive. I, wow. Thank you. I really love and appreciate your support. And it's, I have clearly, I'm on the right path to get that kind of reaction from you. Thanks, man. Well, you got it. <laughs> you got it. Hey folks, I'm going to put Rob's contact information, like his Instagram and his, and can I put Word Turtle Island's uh, website in, in the comments or, or are you keeping that on the download for a little while longer? No, it's, it'll be, it's just, it's a redirect link. So if you just, yeah, put wordturtleisland.com in your, in your web browser, you're going to land on a page and okay. that page will let you find out stuff and join a mail list. Yeah, so good. Because I didn't ask for any visuals today because I, I wanted to be able to focus on what you had to say about the making of the artwork looks fun, but the story behind it is even more impactful. So again, I wanted to make sure we got that, but definitely I'll put the links in the comment section. So folks, you can go find it. If Chris were here, he would be saying, thank you, Rob. He would also say, please remember folks to like and subscribe to this channel because we're still here at 300 and some odd episodes later. And I think we'll still keep going because people like Rob, you do help to inspire. And, and there's a lot more stories to tell. You got it, man. So take care, everybody, and see you on the next episode, hopefully with Chris right here as well. Take care, everybody. <laughs>